Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens is a stratovolcano located in Skamania County, Washington. This volcano is best known for its huge and disastrous eruption on May 18, 1980. This photograph comes from photographer Robert Landsberg, who of course was in the area at the time of the eruption. Before the eruption, he had visited the area in order to photograph and document all of the changes that were happening. On May 18th, he was within a few miles of the volcano when it erupted. Since he unfortunately was located so close to the explosion, he knew he would be unable to escape this disaster, so instead of focusing on the impossible, he focused on taking as many pictures as possible. Robert was obviously incredibly brave and dedicated, but also very smart. After snapping as many photos as he could, including this one, he then secured his camera in his backpack and covered his backpack with his body. He knew he was unlikely to survive, but wanted to make sure that these photos did. His body was found 17 days later with his backpack still underneath him. His film was of course, um, his film was of course developed and has provided geologists with some really valuable insights with his close documentation of the eruption. In our number 9 spot today we have The Core. This photo shows a physicist named Harold Agnew and while this looks like a relatively normal non-threatening photo, what he has in his hand is truly devastating. Harold is holding the nuclear core of what was nicknamed the Fat Man Atomic Bomb. This means that Harold is holding the nuclear core of the atomic bomb that was later dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. The immediate blast of course took many lives, but so did the long term effects of the bomb like radiation illness and that sort of thing. It's crazy to look at a photo like this because it seems just so perfectly normal when he literally has a life changing world ending device in the palm of his hand. Also I don't think I could ever hold something like that. Not only would I just like not want to, but I would just be so afraid that something was gonna go wrong. In our number 8 spot today we have the Challenger crew. This is a photo that was taken of the clearly very excited Challenger crew as they walked down the ramp ready to head off on their mission. The crew even included 37 year old Krista McAuliffe who was a high school social studies teacher. She had won a spot on this mission through a program with NASA called the Teacher in Space program and she had trained diligently for months in order to be the first non-military person in space. On January 28th, 1986, the Challenger mission proved to be fatal just 73 seconds after liftoff. Two rubber O-rings failed because of the cold temperatures of the morning and on live television the world watched as the spacecraft broke apart and plunged into the ocean, sadly taking the lives of everyone on board. It is an absolutely tragic event made even more chilling by this final photo. In our number 7 spot today we have the plague. This photo comes from the 19th century from the third plague pandemic. This was the first time that the plague had spread to all five continents. While we now know something about what that might have been like, what we haven't had to endure are the doctors that dressed like this. This is a photo of the outfits and masks that plague doctors wore when they would come to your house to treat or diagnose you. The long beak like noses of the masks are very creepy, but they were used to hold herbs and other nicely scented things because they believed that it would help ward off the bad air which at the time is what they thought was causing the sickness. A pandemic certainly is bad enough, thankfully our doctors and nurses are just sticking to scrubs. In our number 6 spot today we have the elephant's foot. This photo looks like it's just a big lump of nothing but it's called an elephant's foot. Don't worry at first I was a little worried too but it has nothing to do with elephants and is only named that because of its appearance. This lump was actually created from the Chernobyl nuclear meltdown and it is just a mass of corium and other materials that were in the core of the reactor. This elephant's foot was located in the steam distribution corridor which is under what's left of the reactor. While this mass doesn't produce as much radiation as it did before, it does still to this day produce a deadly amount. It is said that if you stood in front of it for just 300 seconds, that would be enough to get a lethal dose of radiation. It's kind of crazy that even though they knew this, they were still standing there taking pictures of it. But I'm just glad because we all now get to see it and it gives us just a little more insight into what exactly happened that day. Number 5. Leo the Lion. Believe it or not, you've seen this lion before. In fact, you've probably seen him many times. 
times while watching your favorite films as a kid and even now. The lion in the photo is the one, the only, Leo the lion, the majestic beast who roars the MGM logo, like the old one. Leo the lion was the regular star of MGM since it was founded in 1924. The first MGM lion was called Slats, not Leo, and he actually didn't roar, he was just kind of like looking around, it was more like a gif. But Leo is actually the most familiar roar, like everybody knows what he sounds like. But who is the man having tea with such a lion? Well that of course is Alfred Hitchcock, the king of thrills. This photo was taken in 1957 of the two legends posing to enjoy a hot cup of British tea. Number 4, Walter Yeo. Though the picture itself is a little disturbing, it signifies a life changing moment for Mr. Walter Yeo and also for thousands more. This was one of the world's first plastic surgery procedures. Walter Yeo had suffered a dreadful accident while manning the guns on the HMS Warspite during World War I. He lost both his upper and lower eyelids in the event. A year later, however, he met Sir Harold Gillies, who would be considered the father of plastic surgery. His idea was to take skin from another part of Yeo's body and place it over the area in like a mask-like shape, as you can see in the photo. Dr. Gillies then went on to carry out the surgery on 5,000 injured men from June 1917 onward. And thanks to his work, thousands of people have benefited since the years of the war. Yeo himself lived until he was 70 years old. Number 3, the Dinosphere. The car of the future that really never made it there, and we can see why. Every car we have today has four wheels, not just one. Some have more than that now, it's getting confusing. But in the 1930s, J.H. Purvis had a vision. He called it the Dinosphere. It was a large wheel with a cabin in the center for the driver and the passenger to sit. Funny enough, it did actually work. Check this out. But did anyone else notice the problem with driving it? Yeah. You have to drive like Ace Ventura with his window open because it broke, you know what I mean that scene? Exactly. In order to see past the giant wheel spinning in front of you, you have to kind of rubber neck it out to the side. JH made two prototypes, one ran on gasoline and the other ran on electricity. He even designed a kind of bus version that could fit more passengers, but it still needed mini stabilizer wheels, so it had like six by the end of it. Do I kind of want one though, because it looks fun? Absolutely. Would I want to take it on a road trip across Canada? Absolutely not. Number two, the Hindenburg disaster. Based off the title, you already know that this is a picture of the Hindenburg disaster because I already said it. Spoiler alert. The Hindenburg was the largest dirigible ever built and it was the pride of World War II. Yeah, see, Germany, you know which one I'm talking about. The, but YouTube gets mad. The first successful airship was constructed in 1852 by Henry Giffard, but the problem was he used hydrogen. This made both French and German designs of the craft susceptible to explosions if something went wrong. Hence, exhibit A. What you are seeing in the photo is the direct aftermath of a devastating accident. Um, May 6, 1937, the dirigible touched a mooring mast in Lakehurst, New Jersey, sparking the explosion, which took the lives of 13 passengers and 21 crew members. Something as simple as a small spark from the engine ignited the hydrogen core, and the craft fell 200 feet to the ground in flames. And last but not least, number one, spectators. This is the photo taken at the trial of Al Capone. Yeah, it suddenly makes a lot of sense as to why people are covering their faces. When someone says to you 1930s gangster, Al Capone probably jumps into your head. He was deemed public enemy number one by the US government for bootlegging and other illegal rackets during prohibition. The terror the ruthless gangster incited in the city of Chicago is evident by this image. Witnesses and spectators of the trial covered their faces so they wouldn't be recognized by Capone's vengeful accomplices or Capone himself. Behind those fedoras may lie other criminals yet to be unmasked, or civilians scared of a Tommy gun waking them up at night. Either way, you know he must have been one terrifying dude. Authorities did everything they could to catch him, but he would always slip right through their fingers. Finally, his reign came to an end in 1931 when they caught him on income tax evasions of all things that landed him an eight year sentence. In 10th place, we have the criminal George Washington. The George Washington, whose gravestone is pictured, was not the first US president, but the first prisoner executed via electric chair in Texas. On February 8th of 1924, Texas executed a total of five inmates using its brand new electric chair, which remains a state record for the highest number of executions in a single day. In 1923, Levi 
Levi Todd, who lived in the same area, made himself a new gambling table and promised George Washington he would give him the leftover lumber. But Levi gave the wood to another man, and George was so incensed that he uh, shot and killed Levi as he sat playing poker with some friends seated around that uh, new table. And to add to his crime, George shot Levi's terrified wife as she ran past a window in the uh, Todd home. Mrs. Todd thankfully didn't die. He shot uh, the Todd's dog and emptied his bullet device trying to kill one of the poker players, Frank Larry. But none of his bullets struck Frank and he emptied his own safety device at Washington, hitting him with a load of buckshot. When the shooting subsided, Washington ran into the woods only to be discovered a few days later as he slept and well, the rest is history. I do have a fun fact for y'all though. The electric chair actually has a name. Old Sparky, and it is currently on public display as part of a replica death chamber at the Texas Prison Museum in Huntsville, Texas, along with tubing and straps used in Texas's first execution by lethal injection. Cool, I might go visit that museum now. In ninth place, we have Victorian death photographs. Photographs of loved ones taken after they died may seem kind of morbid by today's standards, but in Victorian England, they were a way of commemorating the dead and blunting the um, sharpness of grief. Remember, unless you were rich enough to have a painting commissioned, there really wasn't a way to preserve visual proof that someone existed, and how they looked for future generations. In images that are both unsettling and strangely poignant, families pose with the dead, and consumptive young ladies elegantly recline, the disease not only taking their life, but increasing their beauty. Victorian life was suffused with death. Epidemics such as diphtheria, typhus, and cholera scarred the country. And from 1861 onwards, the bereaved queen made mourning fashionable. Trinkets of memento mori, meaning remember you must die, took several different forms and existed long before Victorian times. Long exposures when taking photographs meant the dead were often seen more sharply than the um, slightly blurred living because of their, you know, uh, lack of movement. On some occasions, eyes would be painted onto the photograph after it was developed, which was meant to make the deceased more um, lifelike while other times Times death was more obvious. Locks of hair cut from the dead were arranged and worn in lockets and rings, death masks were created in wax, and the images and symbols of death appeared in paintings and sculptures. But in the mid 1800s, photography was becoming increasingly popular and affordable, leading to memento mori, photographic portraiture. Try saying that five times fast. You don't want to know how many times I failed. The first successful form of photography, the daguerreotype, was an expensive luxury, but not nearly as costly as having a portrait painted, which previously had been the only way of permanently preserving someone's image. As the number of photographers increased, the cost of these photos fell. Less costly procedures were introduced in the 1850s, such as using thin metal, glass, or paper rather than silver. I see where Weekend at Bernie's got their inspiration. In eighth place, we have a ghostly mural. The ghostly figure shown in this mural in the Karl Strauss Tunnel in North Rhine-Westphalia, Germany, depicts the 21 young people who died in a stampede in 2010 at Love Parade, a German music festival. At least 500 others were injured in the devastating tragedy. The Love Parade was a free access music festival and parade that originated in 1989 in Berlin. The parade featured stages, but also had floats of music, DJs, and dancers moving through the audience. The Love Parade in Duisburg was the first time that the festival had been held in a closed off area. Between 200,000 and 1.4 million people were reported to be attending the event, and 3,200 police were on hand. As a consequence of the disaster, the organizer of the festival announced that no further Love Parades would be held, and that the festival was permanently cancelled. Criminal charges were brought against 10 employees of the city of Duisburg and the company that organized the event, but eventually rejected by the court due to the prosecutor's failure to establish evidence for the alleged acts of negligence and their, um, oh yeah, causal connection to the deaths. The mural was established by an unknown artist as a reminder of the sad day. In seventh place, time to meet American physicist Harold Agnew. As you might have assumed, pictured is, yep, that physicist holding the nuclear core of the Fat Man atomic bomb, which was dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. The bomb ended up killing about 80,000 people, many of which who died from the long-term effects it caused, like radiation illness and leukemia. It was the second of the only two nuclear weapons ever used in warfare, and its detonation marked the third nuclear explosion in history. It was built by scientists and engineers at Los Alamos Laboratory using plutonium from the Hanford site, and was dropped from the Boeing B-29 Super Fortress boxcar piloted by Major Charles Sweeney. The name Fat Man refers to the early design of the bomb because it had a wide round shape. Fat Man was an implosion type nuclear weapon with a solid plutonium core. In sixth place, we have Carl Wallenda. Carl Wallenda was a German American high wire artist and the founder of the Flying Wallendas, a daredevil circus troupe whose members performed dangerous stunts far above the ground, often without a safety net, and still perform to this day. The photo that stayed with me was from a triumphant moment in 1978, just after he crossed the Tower Bridge in London by, yep, tightrope. Later that year, at the age of 73, Carl attempted a walk between the two towers of the 10-story Condado Plaza Hotel in San Juan, Puerto Rico, on a wire-stretched 
121 feet above the pavement. As a result of high winds and an improperly secured wire, he lost his balance and fell during the attempt, and it was caught entirely on camera. Speaking of the Flying Walenda Strip, as I mentioned before, they still perform to this day, with Carl's great-grandson Nick Walenda breaking world records and performing feats that make my stomach turn. Next up is what you probably see when you die. It's number five, the Carbon Star. This one, unlike the last, kind of got me. It seemed unassuming at first, but the longer you stare in the little orange glow of the void, the more you pick up. The hexagonal patterns of mist, the layers and colors, it all amounts into a tunnel of sheer oblivion reminiscent to light speed in Star Wars. I feel like if you drink a little bit of funky tea and pull this picture up on a laptop, you could possibly discover the meaning of the universe somewhere in it. Dare you to try if you're brave. This baleful orange eye is Carbon Star C.W. Lewis, as seen by the Hubble Space Telescope. NASA and the European Space Agency captured this image in 2021 as the star collapsed inwards upon itself and died. More ghastly figures of the sky. Let's do Ghost Nebula for number four. Another entrancing surrealist painting-esque image. This photo captured in 2018 by the Hubble Space Telescope is depicting the ghost nebula that haunts the constellation of Cassiopeia. It's absolutely beautiful, it's spectral-like appearance coming from a veil of swirling gases and dusts. As mentioned, it really does have the cadence of a surrealist painting. To give you comparison, this untitled piece by Salvador Dali shows textures, tones, and shifting lines that I personally find reflective and even haunting about this particular space formation. Even if humans cannot see some such things as the ghost nebula with our own two eyes as we stand on earth with our own two feet. The connection between man and the divine above has always shown through in art. How we spent so long staring up at the wonders above us that even unwittingly without ever truly seeing them, we've always found ways to capture and convey the sky, the stars, and their artistic fluidity into something two-dimensional such as the wisps of a surrealist painting. And now we're incredibly lucky to capture these beautiful space formations such as the ghost nebula in images like the one I can show you today. Number three will have have you ready to sing? This is Halloween. It's a jack-o'-lantern sun. Isn't that the funnest thing you've ever seen though? And while it may look like an impressive feat of Photoshop, this is actually a purely natural phenomena. Similar to our earlier gaping maw, still such an ew name, this jack-o'-lantern face is the result of a series of active regions on the sun bursting and bubbling, making what appears to be a cosmic pumpkin carving appear on the sun. Or maybe it was the work of Jack Skellington. For number two, we're going to stare into the scariest void of all, the eye of a typhoon. This is our Earth, the one we're on right now, obviously, and in March of 2015, Typhoon Masak, also called Typhoon Shedang, went, spent a week ravaging the Philippines, killing five and injuring dozens. During that time, astronauts at the International Space Station were able to look down upon the Category 5 storm, prompting the European Space Agency astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti to capture the horrifying image you see on screen. The power of the formation is visible even from the safe distance of space as rain and lightning hide behind the deadly swirl. And coming in at number one is Space Station After Dark. While it could arguably be a still from Insidious 16, the Space Spectre, this nightmare picture is actually just part of the European Space Agency's astronauts Alexander Gerst's photo series, which he naturally chose to make about, no, 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 not pretty stars or colors or earth cloud rotations, no, 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 no. His collection was the International Space Station at night, which evidently is horrifying. But Gerst had been up in space for a full year at this point, so I mean, to him, this was bread and butter, baby. Or maybe freeze-dried bread and butter. The main photo I'd like to address is the empty space suits with covers over the helmets, which look like a good start to a horror film. Honestly, maybe I never recovered from that alien horror film life, but space just isn't for me. Number 10, Amelia Earhart. An American aviation pioneer and celebrated figure in the early 20th century, Amelia Earhart was the first female aviator to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. Notably, in 1932, she became the first woman to fly solo non-stop across the Atlantic Ocean, covering a distance of over 2,000 miles from Newfoundland, Canada to Northern Ireland. Beyond her aviation achievements, Earhart was a prominent advocate for women's rights. She encouraged women to pursue careers and goals that were traditionally considered to be male-dominated. Earhart was also an author and a, pub and a popular public speaker, which I wish I could do, and she wrote several books about her experience in aviation and women's issues. In this photo, what seems to be a normal photo of Amelia is actually the last photo we have of her before she went missing. She may have survived her round the world attempt only to be later captured by Japanese forces. According to a newly discovered photograph, and according to the New History Channel documentary, the photo is found in a National Archive file as it is shown Earhart alive after her plane fell low on fuel during her mission. The photo depicts a woman believing to be Earhart and a man who looked like her navigator, Fred. A Japanese ship can be seen in the background, carrying what appears to be her plane, as her fate has been debated for decades and has sparked several conspiracy theories. Mona, 
What do you guys think? Or are people just hopeful? Number nine, Volcano. We all love a good nature tour or park hike, but for this man, David Johnston, he really loved the nature of volcanoes and geology, and ultimately pursued his education in the field. He was working with the US Geological Survey at the Cascades Volcano Observatory in Vancouver, Washington, and he was assigned to monitor the activity of Mount St. Helens, a stratovolcano that had been showing recently a lot of activity. This photo is when he was doing his research on the earthly giant, but tragically on May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted explosively, triggering a massive landslide and a pyroclastic flow. David Johnston was stationed at the observation post on the ridge known as Coldwater 2, about six miles north of the volcano. He radioed in the now famous message, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it, to his colleagues at the USGS headquarters, alerting them to the eruption. Regrettably, Johnston's post was directly in the path of the advancing pyroclastic flow, and he perished in the eruption alongside with many others. His body was unfortunately never recovered, and he was only 30 years old. Number eight, the 1986 Challenger. I love space, and I think space is really amazing and cool, as so did these guys, the crew members of the Challenger. Francis R. Scooby, Michael J. Smith, Ronald McNair, Alison Onezuka, Judith Resnick, Gregory Jarvis, and Christina McAuliffe. The Challenger mission was unique because it included Christina, a civilian school teacher who was selected to be the first private citizen to fly in space as part of NASA's Teacher in Space program. However, the Challenger suffered a massive disaster when the failure of an O-ring seal in the right solid rocket booster. Cold temperatures in the morning of the launch weakened the O-ring's elasticity, allowing hot gases to escape and damage the external fuel tank, leading to an explosion that was witnessed by millions of people around the world, and it was a devastating blow to NASA and the space program. Following the disaster, the space shuttle program was suspended for over two years, and significant changes were made to the shuttle's design and launch protocols. After its investigation, the disaster also led to a renewal focus on the importance of safety in human spaceflight. Number seven, Menendez Brothers. We're all fans of something, whether it's art, music, or sports, and for the Menendez Brothers, they would be so excited to see that they happen to be in the photo card, but the most disturbing part of this photo is the fact that these two killed their parents before the photo was even taken. They went on a six-month spending binge with their money. The case this was so shocking to the media, including how after the deaths occurred, the brothers went to watch James Bond's License to Kill and tried to use it as an alibi. How a week prior, their mother confided to her therapist that she was worried that her sons were psychopaths, and how one brother brought an entire chicken wing restaurant with the parents' money after they had passed away. Their father was an executive in the entertainment industry, and both went into private schools, and the older brother, Lyle, was briefly enrolled in Princeton. After two deadlock juries, LA prosecutors retired the brothers in a courtroom that did not allow cameras, and the new jury found them guilty on two counts of the first degree. They were sentenced by the judge to life in prison. Number six, Aquino. Filipino people have been known to fight resistance against pluralism and oppressors, as that seems to be all of our history to be composed of, and that is the truth. And for Ninoy Aquino, he was opposing threat as the political activist against the long dictatorship and assailant of the martial law, Fernandez Marcos. He tried to run for president in 1973, but then Marcos declared martial law in 1972, preventing him to run. Benigno Aquino, or as we know by his nickname, Ninoy Aquino, was imprisoned by the Marcos regime for speaking out against him where he was locked in prison and tormented for seven years. It wasn't until he suffered a heart attack did Marcos' wife Emilda allow him to go to the United States to get treatment, only under the condition that he does not come back home to the Philippines. But Aquino knew that his love for the people and the Philippines was more important as there were many people wrongfully prosecuted or just be found dead on the street for protesting against Marcos. He did plan to go back and before he arrived to the Philippines, he warned reporters, hey, this might be the last time you ever actually speak to me, and he was right. In this photo was the photo before he left the plane out towards the Philippines airport. He kept saying he had a bulletproof vest on, but the assailant shot him in the head. There were countless reporters that day that knew something was going on, only for them to be all shocked to see his body on the ground. There's even footage of his assassination on Line, and his death sparked an outrage throughout all of the Philippines asking for justice. But of course, the United States always has to get involved in something, and they were able to get the Marcos family out of persecution from the very people he tormented and controlled for years. Oh look, it's the D-Bags Day Off! Camp staff! Check out this jolly-go-lucky group. They got the day off of work because the weather was nice for the first time in a long time. During the wartime, that must have been awesome. Especially being young. Finally shirk responsibility. Maybe go get a pint, have a picnic, hang out with each other, maybe get a little frisky, lavishing in the sun. I'm done looking at them. In fact, I'm sick by having to look at them. When that group of people is going to have lighted and silly summer fun on a day off, they're going back to their jobs at the camps of World War II. To do exactly what you're thinking they would be doing for work when I say they work at the camps of World War II. And they enjoyed it. This wasn't one of those mandatory war jobs or excuses you can make up for falling
following orders. These young adults, who may as well be the grandmothers, grandfathers, or great grandma or pa of people even watching, chose to do this job and actively enjoyed it. So this is a good reminder, it's not that far in the past, and these people most likely took live shortly before or after this photo was taken. Uh, did Halloween come early, or is it just Sylvester Claus? Yeah, so, um, I chose this photo out of trust me, like, thousands of equally creepy ones, because I feel it truly captures the what the bleep factor this holiday has. And they do it every 31st of December to 13th of January. The Sylvester Clausen of Ernach and the surrounding area Appenzell custom that is famous throughout Switzerland. The custom derives its charm from the unique blending of contrasts such as nature and art, mystery and tradition, harmony and anarchy. The Sylvester Claus that ushered the old year out and ring in the new. There are three types of these clauses. The beautiful, the ugly, and the pretty ugly. Common to all the clauses are bells in various shapes and sizes that they wear on their bodies. Their rituals begin in the early morning each day. The various shupal meet at the village square before each group goes its own way. A group will pull up in front of your house, then hop around and jump up and down to make the bells ring, and then they start yodeling at you. You listen to the yodel, they say happy new year, give you some cash, some liquor you have to drink from a straw, and then they just leave. Dark backstory gossip, however, in times of poverty and hunger, which afflicted the region frequently, Clausen was a way to earn a little extra money, and in the 1930s, what was known as Belchel Claus, aka the Beggar Claus, began to appear on the streets. Essentially, homeless Santa Clauses, but Santa looked like that. As a result, the influx of beggars in the Claus Guide resulted in heavy restrictions, and in the 1950s, the custom had nearly died out. It's only thanks to the initiative of individuals in the 1970s that this got to come back and enjoys enormous popularity today. Somebody come get their creepy uncle. Cannot tell me this isn't the energy this photo gives. Creepy uncle. The woman is unidentified, but definitely a follower to be able to handle that guy's BO and greasy hands on her. It was taken of the children of God leader David Berg. This group started in 1968 in California after Berg claimed God himself had gifted him with prophecies. In reality, Berg started making extreme demands of his followers, give up their money, worldly possessions in exchange for limited outside access, horrible cramped living conditions, brainwashing, and oh yeah, a would make this group famous for really bad reasons I can't and would rather not get into. Former members of COG have been outspoken about the childhood they suffered growing up in the communes. Actress Rose McGowan, the most famously outspoken, published her story of nine years in the group. Actors Joaquin and River Phoenix, also raised in the cult, had it harder than Rose, and that trauma plagued River especially. He was actually the original heartthrob of the 80s and 90s, a role, fun fact, DiCaprio only managed to take once River's substance addiction caused by his traumatic childhood unfortunately took his life. So more of an unfun fact, but the matter stands that River painted the way for DiCaprio and this psycho ruined a lot of people's lives. Have you ever seen a photo you can feel? Before you see the photo itself, you're going to learn about the man in it. So Joseph Goebbels, a national socialist politician and propagandist who held multiple high rank roles in the uh, Yahtzee party. As a party chief for Greater Berlin, 1926 to 45, Reich leader of propaganda, 1929 to 45, and in 1933, the push broom mustache twit appointed Joseph the Minister for Propaganda and Public Enlightenment. He was a devout and brittle through and through bigot, a tireless agitator, and the propaganda this man designed, wrote, and funded had shipped through dozens of countries and shaped the perspective of Jews in a way that can actually never be undone. It's this propaganda many people still cite when asked for factual basis or logical argument as what Jews had done oh so wrong. It's Joseph who orders the mass burning of literature, who sentenced thousands to death and who made up lies to ensure hatred, a hatred that still stands today. And I want you guys to see how he looked at them. So here is the photo, finally. This is a picture of Joseph Goebbels taken only seconds after he found out the photographer was Jewish. In this photo, you can feel it. And it's effing terrifying. And now, the last photo is from El Monte, 6 May. That's the date written on this photo from the LAPD Collective. And it's the only other photo from said collection I chose to put on this list aside from the holes in the car window. Window. As follows is the photo and James L. Roy's written description of it. This is a detective modeling a mask worn by Baxter Shorter's crew. Shorter was in a gaggle with Emmett Perkins, Jack Santos, and Barbara Graham. The three of them then killed an old woman named Mabel Monahan on 9 March 1953. Shorter was appalled by his gaggle's violence. He ratted the others out and Santo and Perkins kidnapped him in front of his pad on Bunker Hill, took him to the mountains, and killed him. Shorter had a sister that lived in El Monte and they were hunting 
sifting through it for evidence. This mask was in her pad, James Elroy. If Mabel Monahan's former son-in-law, Tudor Scherer, hadn't been a Las Vegas gambler, the 60-year-old widow probably would have never been killed. Also, if she didn't stay friends with him after he divorced her daughter, that'd probably have helped. But she did, and people found that weird. So there had to be something at play, right? Maybe Scherer trusted her so much he stored his 100 grand floats there. Ex-cons Emmett Perkins, John True, and Jack Santos think that, and they plan to take it. Barbara Graham joins the group to be their key into the door. Mabel takes a while to open up, but Barbara persuades her with the story of a broken down car and pleas for the phone. Mabel was reluctant, but the young woman was alone, and the widow knew firsthand how scary it could be for a woman to be on her own at night, so she let her in. And in comes John True, Jack, Emmett, wearing rubber masks. We're gonna take a pause. Ladies and female presenters, our own sex does not guarantee our safety, and you can't predict anyone's intentions. Please trust your gut if it says don't open that door. Mabel is struck on the head, left gagged and bleeding in the hallway. The group ransacks her home for a safe that never exists and panic when there is none, so they just leave her there. Mabel is dead for two days in her home before she's found. The investigation into the slaying of the Burbank widow began, and it was a long one, filled with drama. In the end, the four are charged with conspiracy to commit burglary, robbery, and M-word on June 3rd, 1953, in the death of Miss Mabel Monahan. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Mad Bomber. This is a photo that was taken of someone known as the Mad Bomber. His real name is George Metzke, and he was the man who terrorized New York City for 16 years while he planted explosives in public places like an absolute psychopath. I guess he was apparently angry about a workplace injury he had suffered in the years prior to his terrible crimes, and so, of course, the normal reasonable jump to make would be um, not that at all. While no one should have ever had to suffer because of these crimes, the good news is that while he planted 33 bombs and set off 22 of them, miraculously only 15 people ended up injured in the end. This photo of him behind bars is extremely eerie thanks to his creepy smile and haunting eyes. I might be the only one who feels it, but it just seems like something's off. You know? In our number nine spot today, we have the figures of the fire. This photo is both extremely unsettling and super captivating as it shows a scene after the great fire at Madame Tussauds in 1925. Of course, this wax museum is famous for the extremely lifelike wax figures that are created and find their home there, so you can only imagine the aftermath of the fire. These lifelike figures with missing heads and appendages, burnt skin and hair, and just clothing in disarray. Seeing this photo for the first time without knowing the story behind it was definitely a bit of a confusing and terrifying experience. The heads on the ground really freaked me out for a full five seconds. As scary as it is, I'm glad to hear it's not real and just some creative casualties rather than what this photo appears to be at first. In our number eight spot today, we have the Spectre. This is a photo that was taken in England in 1963, and it became known as the Spectre of the Newbie Church. That is, of course, because of the ghostly figure that can be seen in the photo. I personally am always a little suspicious of ghost photos. Some are certainly more convincing than others, but Photoshop in 1963 wasn't exactly as accessible and easy as it is now. This photo is said to have been taken by Reverend K.F. Lord inside of the Newbie Church, which is located in North Yorkshire, England. Of course, I mean, like many of us are going to do, people were really skeptical of this apparition and just believed it was a well done case of double exposure, which to be fair, is entirely possible. The reverend continued to swear up and down however that the photo was not doctored, so at this point there's no proof to prove either side and it's just a game of he said she said. So what do you guys think? Apparition caught slipping or is the reverend just making it up? In our number 7 spot today we have the Tsar Bomba. This is a photo that was taken on October 30th, 1961, it was quite the Halloween spooky fright that year as this is said to be the largest and most powerful nuclear weapon ever created and tested. The hydrogen aerial bomb was developed in the Soviet Union by a group of nuclear physicists that were under the leadership of Igor Kurchatov. The bomb was dropped by parachute and was detonated autonomously. While this test was meant to be a secret, turned out to be less than well kept as it was obviously a huge explosion that was detected by United States intelligence agencies. A secret US recon aircraft 
aircraft called Speedlight Alpha was there monitoring the explosion and it got so close that it had its anti-radiation paint absolutely scorched off. The photo clearly shows the bomb as it exploded and it is said that this bomb was 5,000 times stronger than the ones that were dropped on Japan during World War II. That's not to say that those ones weren't strong because they were absolutely devastating, it's just an example to show how large this one really was. In our number 6 spot today we have the 3 Jacksons. On August 21st, 1934, three fearless acrobats known as the 3 Jacksons, Charlie Smith, Jewel Waddick, and Jimmy Kerrigan all performed a routine on the edge of the Empire State Building, which is when this photo was captured. It is said that these three toured as an acrobatic trio and this stunt the photo captured was done at 1,245 feet. According to officials from the Empire State Building, it is said that this was the first time the stunt was attempted and to this day it has never been done again, which makes a lot of sense. While this photo is absolutely incredible and is such a testament not only to the trust that they shared but also their abilities as acrobats, I don't know who in their right mind would try to recreate this. We already have one, I think we can just all be happy with that. Number 5 is the Frozen Man of Mount Everest. And yeah, yeah, I get it, we all know that there's tons of frozen bodies along Mount Everest, but that's not what I'm actually talking about this time. The photo you'll see is of mountain climber Beck Weathers, who in May of 1996 attempted to complete the final leg of the ascent on Everest. Despite how short the distance was, the journey caught up to Beck, and he came down with a case of snow blindness during an intense blizzard that had a wind chill of 100 degrees below zero, and he fell into a hypothermic coma. Initially I thought I was in a dream, Weathers later recalled. Then I saw how badly frozen my right hand was, and that helped bring me around to reality. Beck was left for dead, first by his exhibition, and then the second time by a rescue crew doctor who believed him beyond saving. So it's only by miracle that Beck manages to break a hypothermic coma turn around and walk back to base camp. When he reaches camp, Beck is airlifted immediately as frostbite set in on his nose and hands, both of which are later amputated. This moment is caught in photograph and shows the frozen hand and Beck visibly unconscious being carried in a red sleeping bag. This ascent to Everest is remembered as the 1996 Mount Everest disaster and is famously covered in John Krakauer's book Thin Air and its 1997 adaption as well as films Everest and Everest 2015. So by the way, they prematurely told Beck's wife and family he had passed away. Can you imagine that emotional roller coaster? Number four is the Maori trophy heads. The native Maori of New Zealand had a cultural practice of preserving severed heads of enemies for trophy and warning purposes. They are called mokomokai, and these heads were processed by first, of course, getting chopped off, but then boiled, smoked, and sun dried. The Maori would then coat them in shark oil to prevent cracking and peeling before mounting them. When British colonizers invaded the land during the 1840s, the Maori heads were one of the famously pillaged artifacts and treasures of the colonial era. Era. Major General Horatio Gordon Robley was in service for the British Army when they were invading and pillaging New Zealand in the 1960s. He was particularly enthralled by the Maori heads and the absolute piece of you know what actually stole 35 of them for his own collection. You can see him in this photo sitting at the base of a wall with Maori heads mounted upon him. Naturally like most of what was stolen by British colonialists for the crown and or for themselves, these items were never returned to their rightful peoples and instead earned profit in British museums or collect dust in storerooms. Since the 1970s, New Zealand has had a strong record of requesting those remains back from overseas. The first major international reparation of a toy moko happened in 1985, and in 2003, New Zealand created its first government funded international reparations program. It's now seen the return of 800 Maori and Moriori remains. Number three is the Ruhr Cannibal Demonstration, an image caught by police officers as the Ruhr himself, Joaquin Kroll reenacts one of the crimes after his capture. Kroll was very particular about how he killed and only doing so in the same place on a few occasions and years apart. This and the fact of the number of other killers operating in the area at the time, it helped him evade capture. This killer started in 1955 and didn't stop for two decades until his capture. He's known to have taken 14 lives without any rhyme or reason, no preference for age, gender, race, status, everyone was on the table. Pun intended unfortunately, as Kroll wasn't just necrophilic with the bodies, he ate them too. After taking their lives and using their bodies, he would bring home pieces to cook. He was finally caught in 1976 after police discovered intestines from one of his victims clogging the plumbing of the apartment building. Police reported that when a neighbor had asked Kroll about them and if he had knew what had backed up the pipes earlier, Kroll simply replied, 
guts. Why the police felt the need to reenact his crime photos, I'm not sure, but the result is several photos of Kroll propped over a volunteer in the park looking full of ecstasy and primal delight that will send a shiver down your spine. Number two is the tragic death of cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov. So imagine knowing you're going to die but still walking aboard. That is what the Soviet astronaut Vladimir did on April 23rd, 1967. The craft had shown countless issues and flaws during testing to an extent where it wasn't even just Vladimir who knew this was going to happen. It was everyone working the project. So why did it go forward despite clear danger? No one was willing to back out and risk the fury or disappointment of the Soviet high command. So Vladimir could have backed out himself, but it would have doomed the next astronaut to be put on the project, who happened to be his close friend, Yuri Gargan. So he was assigned to the mission, and he decided he would do it and spare anyone else. Upon re-entry to Earth, the tragedy happens. The craft's parachute fails, and the Soyuz craft hurtled to Earth at unthinkable speeds, burning Vladimir alive inside. Photos of the craft were taken after its impact showing a horrific scene of melted plastics, metal and char. He became the first human to ever die in space flight and Vladimir himself was so confident this would be the case that he asked for an open casket funeral that it forced his superiors to see what they'd done to him. And so the second famous photo of this incident is taken, Vladimir's superiors standing over the mangled bunch of melted and charred human bones with nauseated horror in their gaze. And so in at number one is what's considered the Creepiest photo ever taken by the internet? Broken Blanche Monnier. This is a real life horror story. Blanche is born in 1849 and starts life living lavishly and beloved in her prominent French family home, ingrained with ideas of Prince Charming and happily ever afters. She remains unmarried into her 20s, however, and searches desperately for her true love so she may move away from her domineering mother. It's in 1874 that her wish is granted and she meets an older man of status and intends to marry him. But Mama disagrees and she's not feeling he's suitable and she needs someone else. Blanche is furious. He can support her. He's high class, a lawyer. That's everything her mother demanded she finds and she finally found it. Blanche finally put her foot down against her mother and her mother makes her regret it for decades to come. Blanche is locked away in the attic closet. There are no windows and only a hay mattress. Once a day her mother would cram dinner scraps under the doorway for her to eat. Blanche's mother reminds her every day that if she gives up on her betrothed she would free Blanche. Blanche refuses every time even after her fiance unbeknownst to her passes away in 1885 while she's still imprisoned. It wouldn't have mattered however, the public had been told by her mother that Blanche had been dead since she locked her away in 1874, so everyone just thought that was the case. Blanche meanwhile survived 16 years in this closet until an anonymous note to police by a maid forces authorities to search the home. They find Blanche, now middle aged, malnourished, covered in sores and fecal matter, surrounded by vermin and rot. This moment is caught on film by police. You'll see Blanche sitting on her bed, an excited yet lost expression on her face. Her mother and brother were both charged and her mother very very quickly and deservedly dies in prison while her brother manages to appeal and escape justice. Blanche is left a shell of a person from 16 years of solitary and dark confinement. She spent the rest of her life in a psychiatric care at one of the state's best hospitals, the sole heir to her mother's precious fortune and status. First up is captured in a card. Alrighty, so you see this basketball card here. So centered, we've got Mark Jackson back in 89 playing a Knicks game. But over here in the far left background, we have familiar faces of Lyle and Eric Mendez. In in 1990, the Mark Jackson NBA hoops card went into circulation, a year after the two Mendez brothers depicted in the background killed their parents for life insurance in August of 1989. The brothers claimed a massive payout that allowed them to live a luxurious lifestyle, spending money on expensive watches, clothes and cars. Among the items that they bought were tickets to a basketball game at Madison Square Garden, where they would eventually be immortalized on an NBA card. To make it a little creepier, logistically this moment captured would have been between when they killed their parents and when they were arrested. Speaking of sports, there's such a thing as the wrong time to cheer, which is our next photo. See, this is Mike Hawthorne and Ivor Webb celebrating with champagne after winning the 24H Le Mans. Look at the revelry and the glory between these men. Those around them have a completely different vibe, however. We've got an arrangement of meme expressions going on here. Homeboy in the back holding the book is giving a hell of a judgmental side eye, and we have a signature auntie are you serious expression going on. See, while these men are a statically celebrating their win, what isn't captured in this photo was that the raceway was covered in ambulances and fire trucks. Hawthorne had driven an opponent off the track and the resulting accident killed 84 people, most of which were spectators. Videos of this event on YouTube are kinda insane to watch, not even because of the crash or the arrogance of the winners, but the announcer is so painfully cheery it's out of place, using an old timely projection system to shout, oh women and 
children are dying, whole families are wiped out, but most of the finishing cars were British, a fine achievement in this abhorrent tragedy. It feels like a fever dream. Mountain climb to heaven is next. Because if you climb Mount Everest, let's be realistic, all you're doing is making your inevitable trip to heaven a little shorter of a distance upwards, giving yourself and the creator a little shortcut, you know? Alright, so this photo has the same visual quality as some loosely scattered cat litter, but I'm sure you can make out that we've got these silly little tents here, man look how far tents have come, as well as these two dudes and what it looks like high socks. This is the 1924 British Mount Everest expedition. We've talked about a few Mount Everest climber groups and things that have happened to them in a few of our videos, so you may be familiar with this one from our channel. That or literally any Mount Everest movie, they tend to either pick one specific story to document or mismatch all of them together for one plot and then throw Jake Gyllenhaal up on a mountain. Anyways, this photo was taken of George Mallory and Sandy Irvin. Shortly after, they made their ill-fated attempt to get to the summit. While Mallory's body is found literally decades later in 1999, the body of Irvin never has been. Our next photo is of an undeserving celebrity. Why? Because the reason he's a celebrity is so extremely twisted that it blows me away. And I don't mean an undeserving in a Kim Kardashian made a family of talentless people famous through adult video kind of way. I mean in a seriously sick, twisted, criminal, undeserving way. I'll only be calling this man IS, as I do not believe any more infamy should be granted. The photo you see was from a Japanese magazine after he was released from prison due to insanity. IS killed Dutch born Rene Harveld, and the two were studying in Sorbonne, Paris. He chose to do this because of her health and her beauty characteristics that he felt he lacked. IS considered himself weak, ugly, and small, and claimed he wanted to absorb her energy through, well, he had her body for three days. I'll simply let you piece together what I mean when I say that he had a considerable amount of this body missing and a very interesting fridge contents. But like I said, he was released, so how can you kill someone whilst on a student visa, desecrate remains, and then also do some pretty horrific acts posthumously? He is from a very wealthy Japanese family and they somehow managed to get him released. Also, they paid the victim's parents a huge sum of money for the loss. That's the world we live in. After his release, he was frequently on talk shows, reviewed restaurants for magazines, and appeared in horror films. He even wrote a book on the murder of Rene. This next photo shows us you never know what could be just a reach away. This photo looks relatively normal. Now, obviously, it's not gonna be. It's on this list, and the fact that it's titled about reaching out to something, well, Sarah Funk, who you see here on the waterline, is a YouTube vlogger who's on a trip to Cyprus's Red Lake. And you can see her literally like two feet away from a suitcase lodged in the waterbed. It's two years after this photo's taken in 2019 that the drifting suitcase is retrieved and opened to reveal the corpse of a girl. She is one of seven known victims of serial killer Nikos Mexata, whose signature was doing body dumps in suitcases. It's believed the reason this case was retrieved in the first place was due to previous sightings of it in the water once other victims of Nikos had started to be found and identified at the same time period. Sarah Funk has since commented on what it's like to know that she was so close to a body without being aware. I thought it was a log at the time, but in retrospect, I realized it wasn't. This is a completely fair explanation. As you can see from that picture, the case was incredibly dirty and hard to identify even as a briefcase. This man is the first recorded serial killer on the island of Cyprus and is currently serving seven life sentences in central prison. 